Brendan, nice to see you. Nice to see you, thanks for having me. What's Oishi? So uh, I'm Brendan, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Oishi. Uh, we're an indoor farming company with really three key points of differentiation. So the first is we go strawberries. I don't know if anybody's seen our berries. It's the Oishi berry. Uh, and we're obsessive about product quality. The second is we've developed the technology that unlocks the ability to grow flowering crops like strawberries in an indoor farming environment. And third, um, we're really focused on building an amazing brand in the produce category. We think there's a lot of opportunity for brand creation in the category. So I got into agriculture and indoor farming really from the lens of food security. Uh, I started my career as a military intelligence officer and I became really fascinated with answering the question, what's the war that we're gonna fight in 100 years or in 200 years? And the deeper I dug into answering that question, the more conviction I had that food and water security would be major conflict drivers over the longer term. Uh, so I cut my teeth in agriculture, actually not in the tech space, but in East Africa working with smallholder farmers in coffee and avocados. And I learned very quickly how much climate was impacting us as well as plant disease. But I also learned it was really difficult to scale agriculture. Even 50 kilometers away, we couldn't recreate what we were doing in coffee in that region of Uganda and perfectly copy and paste. Right, right. And that's kind of how I got into indoor farming. Um, so with indoor farms, you could grow at consistent quantity, quality, and price, pesticide-free year-round, but you can do it without regard to the outside environment. So here in the greater New York City area, we have snow in the winter. What? Um, and it's really hot. <laughs> yeah, not as much anymore. And it's really hot in, in the summer. And so we're able to grow 365 days a year. Um, I'll leave one more thing. The, the Japanese were indoor farming, uh, they were really the pioneers in the space. My co-founder is from Japan, and we learned a lot of the lessons about some of the early failures from the, uh, the evolution of what I'll call indoor farming 1.0 mm -hmm. in Japan, and that's how we built their thesis. One, have a differentiated product, two, have a technology that drives it, and three, uh, build an amazing brand. Yeah, Brendan, can you pull up those strawberries again, please? Sure. Um, why focus on strawberries? Yeah, well, we think that um, there's a huge opportunity to differentiate product in the space. And so the trend is, over a long period of time, this isn't just like a fad for a day or two mm -hmm, or a month. Mm -hmm. Over many decades, consumers care more about the product quality, but also the stories of the product, where it comes from, how it's produced. And so I think perhaps the best example is the specialty coffee industry's emergence over the past three or four decades, right? So 30 years ago, coffee was what? It was commodity, right? And then you saw Starbucks come to the scene with a higher product quality, mm -hmm. at least at that time, but also they created this like, you know, the second place, this place mm -hmm. away from home and changed the experience with, with the product. And today you have your third or fourth or fifth wave coffee shops with even higher product quality, unique extraction sure. methods. And I don't think anybody today would say like a latte is a luxury experience. That's like a lot of people's everyday experience. So what we're trying to do with strawberries is very similar, not just make the product better, but change the experience that people have in consuming fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, and we do that in three ways. One, we have uh, the genetics and we focus on genetics that are really optimized for quality. And so much of what we grow outdoors has to be transported all across the world uh, and across the country. Um, you know, the second thing that we do is we're extremely focused on, um, we're extremely focused on creating R&D that perfects the product uh, quality with those genetics. So we take the right genetics and then we do a lot of R&D temperature, CO2, humidity, photo period, nutrition to really create the recipe. And then the third thing we do is we build our operation and our technology around that to do it at scale. In the beginning, it's a little bit more expensive, but over the past five or six years, we've decreased the cost of production by about 75%. And over time, we hope to democratize access. Yeah, so to, to be clear, you're producing strawberries out of season. That That's okay, mm -hmm. that's not what I, I'm getting at. But how do you replicate the flavor of a, of a strawberry that's in peak season, that it's at its ripest, at its most delicious? Yeah, so when, when you're growing strawberries conventionally, outdoors, right? you're taking a genetic that's optimized for mostly transportation. So 88% of strawberries are grown in the state of California in the United States. And then they're shipped to markets, you know, two, three, four, five days later. 
Um, so you're engineering a berry for transportation. Mm -hmm. For us, it's about how do you start with the right genetics that unlock flavor, then create the right recipe for that flavor, and then build your technology around that to scale the flavor. And they're delicious. Thank you. <laughs> they really are. Um, the vertical in, uh, farming industry, as we heard earlier, has seen so many changes in, in the last few years. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that from your perspective and how you want to overcome sort of the, the challenges that, that still exist. Yeah, you know, indoor farming in the past two to three years has probably been most known for the large failures and bankruptcies that we've seen, which are super unfortunate for the employees, for the founders, and for the shareholders alike. But what you don't hear is that the indoor farming industry is really following like the same curve of development of other technologies and in other industries. And so that classic run up to inflated expectations, Gartner hype cycle, you fall to kind of a trough and then you come out and stabilize. Indoor farming is like at or emerging from and coming out of the trough. Um, I like to use an analogy of the automobile industry. Early 1900s, like 1908, there was over 200 manufacturers of automobiles, right? By the 1930s, there was like 40. And then there was further consolidation, and so you only know a handful of those. So indoor farming is simply going through the same consolidation of those other industries. But what's really apparent is that the core problems that we're solving, we heard about these like consistently as themes today, um, they're not going away. Right. So for example, labor, everybody in this room who runs a business knows that labor is a challenge. Indoor farms have a clearer path towards automation than outdoor farms. Um, you know, the second is water. Water came up a couple of times today. Uh, with indoor farms, we can recycle the water. We're recycling over 95% of our water. Once you irrigate in the conventional field, that's gone. Yeah. Um, you know, and so the third thing is like extreme climate events. I won't even call it climate change, but crop loss due to uh, extreme weather events continues to increase. And indoor farms are for the most part insulated and isolated from those, those issues. So we're at the trough and we'll emerge from the trough, but it'll take time. Yeah, it takes time. Uh, you know, to wrap up during our next fireside chat, everyone will get a chance to, to taste the strawberries from Oishi. Can you tell us, uh, why should we be excited, I guess, is my question. The strawberries taste amazing. And if you have a good strawberry, you know it. So <laughs> you don't need to do anything, just enjoy the strawberries. It's that simple. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much, Brendan. Thank you. Great Appreciate conversation. It. Thank you.